First of all, I know not all believe in otherworldly things. No cheese off my biscuit. You do you. I'm not here to tell you you're wrong. I can only share what I experienced for myself and leave you to draw your own conclusions. I'm assigned to an extended coverage over the better part of a year in a hundred year old haunted building in the downtown area of our major city. I'll spend most of my weekend nights patrolling while they're in the process of reconstruction and asbestos removal. Every weekend, I arrive to find different areas inaccessible due to asbestos treatment or other construction needs. The project takes longer as a fair amount of the building is being actively used by businesses, which makes the reconstruction trickier. Many of the changes being made are a post-modern insult to the classic features of the building. It hurts my heart to watch the beautiful and elegant appointments give way to the new stylish and moronic ones. The bathrooms had solid granite store dividers. Now they feature mundane modern metal ones. Classic 100 year old chandeliers get replaced by LED moon ring lights. It's like putting bright lipstick and rave glasses on the Mona Lisa. At the beginning of the construction, there are two side hallways that remain intact from the original build out of the building and that feature the original office configuration. They'll both be destroyed before the construction is finished. One of them is on the 12th floor, and even in the brightest light of day, that particular corridor is oppressive and creepy. You simply cannot get enough light into that space to make it feel bright and cheery. Now I'm told tales by the tenants and staff of various deaths associated with the building over its 100 year history. The lawyer shot by his jilted lover on the top floor. It was the long forgotten trial of the century from the same century that saw the O.J. Simpson case. She was also acquitted despite having confessed to doing it. The young woman in white who perpetually tried to fly from the roof and failed. The three-year-old who cries in the basement, something to do with childhood measles I'm told. But nowhere do I find any reports that feature the 12th floor. That notwithstanding, there's something dark and brooding in that corridor. If the light is out down that hall at night, I shine my flashlight down it and move on quickly. The full moon. Now there is one particularly active night, by which I mean the whole building seems to be vibrating with energy and strange things afoot. It's the 13th of the month and a full moon at that. Wheeled scaffolding in one area under construction is in a different location on every patrol. I never see or hear it move but it's all over that place that night. Now this has happened before and remains a creepy curiosity, but this night, it was just more than normal. On the second to top floor, I see what appears to be the shadow of another person coming up behind me. And from the position of its head relative to my own head, they're maybe five feet, about one and a half meters away, when I spin around and see nothing, just an empty hallway. Walking back the other way, the second shadow is gone. And so I go on down quickly to the 12th floor. As I walk down the long main corridor towards the old creepy side corridor, I feel like I'm being watched. I look down that creepy pit of darkness without use of light. And there to my horror, see in a black set, black against the black shadow figure of a man, standing in the middle of the hall with his head flopped to one side in a most unnatural way. If not for it being at eye level, it really looks like a hanging man. With no hesitation, I shine my flashlight down the hall to get a better look and see nothing, just an empty hallway. I lower the flashlight again and now it's just a black hallway. The figure doesn't appear in the returning darkness. I've had enough of this corridor at night. I will not patrol it again this shift. I turn to go down the stairs to the 11th floor I have this intense feeling like I should watch my step, like someone or something wishes to push me down the stairs. I grip the rails on both sides and as I descend a few steps down, I feel a gust of air at my back. There is nothing in the building that can produce a draft on these stairs. This weekend is the only time I ever felt a gust of air on any of the stairs in the building, but now 
I'll feel like I need to watch my step. I do. In the early morning, shortly after sunrise, I turn the keys over to my relief for the next 12 hours. I say nothing to her about the events of the night. When I return 12 hours later for my next shift, she shares with me having felt unsafe on one of the stairs in the building and even feeling wind at his back on it. He can't figure out where it came from. I ask him which stairs. Of course, it's the same stairs from the 12th floor to the 11th floor where I had felt it on the night before. My first patrol that night, I again felt unsafe on that stair and a much smaller puff of air at the back of my head. I turn and yell, you've got to do better than that if you really want to scare me. Nothing else happened that shift. The building returns again to quiet and calm. After. Until they tear out this creepy corridor to replace it with a modern office configuration, I always make sure to get all the lights down before the sun goes down. Some four months later, I learned from one of the tenants that a man had hung himself in that hall on the 12th floor during the 1930s. Somehow, this news came as no surprise to me. Meanwhile, the scaffolding still moves around at night, even with no one in the building to move it. I once or twice hear a crying sound in the basement. The first time, I thought it might be a cat, but the building manager assured me there were no cats. It's a three-year-old ghost, he says. He also says he doesn't believe in ghosts, so... One tenant relates being approached on the top floor by a dapper older gentleman in a very outdated suit who simply vanishes before saying anything. He thinks it's the shot lawyer. I never see anything there. That floor feels at peace. If he is there, he's not as upset about things as the hung man on the 12th floor. Now, when they do start to dismantle that original hallway on the 12th floor, the creepy presence brooding down there becomes rather more active and a bit less predictable. I now feel it increasingly out in the main corridor that still remains essentially unchanged from the original build. At first, it feels angry towards me. It wants me scared and it wants me hurt. I dread going to that floor on every patrol. Some patrols, I take the elevator from the floor above or below, look out at that floor and then go on the next floor and leave it at that. Then I start to feel it there in the middle of the main corridor, in front of the elevators waiting for me. If I take the stairs down that are next to the side corridor, I always feel the malicious presence wanting me to slip, trip, or fall down those stairs. But to be honest, I hate going there for a completely different reason too. I cannot begin to express how much I dislike the tacky changes they are making to this classic building. It feels like a violation of her beautiful turn-of-the-century soul. On one occasion, when the creepy brooding presence seems to be absence, I look over what they are doing to the space that had been the side corridor, and I shake my head and honestly weep a little. It's such an affront. Suddenly, I realise I'm not alone. That unseen being is there. But it's no longer angry towards me. It seems to have decided I'm not part of the problem but feel the same way about the changes as it does. It follows me down two more floors before it withdraws. As it leaves, it feels to me like it just can't stay away from the 12th floor, its floor, for very long at all. This changes my patrols for the remainder of the time I'm working on the site. It's never again an angry, creepy experience to visit that floor. This, despite the door to the new offices in the area of the old side corridor, constantly unlocking itself. I have to relock it at least three times a night. I often feel its presence a floor or two before the 12th floor, and it stays with me for a floor or two after. Sometimes I feel thoughts in my head. It's sort of like the experience I often have where I'm about to open my mouth and say something, just to have a friend or sibling see the exact thing, like they had that thought at first, and I'd somehow gotten it from them before they spoke. Or like the way I always know when my children are lying to me. They really hate that. It feels like the being wants me to know that he hadn't killed himself. This was done to him by others. This is repeated often. But then a few months later, a quiet admission. I did it. I can't take it back. Accompanied with a wave of such a feeling of sorrow, regret and remorse. 
Then it feels like he wants to leave here and maybe go home with me. I simply say, that'll never work. My family wouldn't want you around. That floor feels very sad for the rest of the shift. I look into it. I can never find his name or likeness or the full story of his hanging. Only the rumour shared by a tenant of his death. I never have a name to call him by. Since this particular contract ended, I've never been back to the building. I suspect if I ever do return, I'll still have a strange friend waiting for me there. Before I was born, there was a systematic program that destroyed Native American culture and ripped off the United States government while doing so. It also victimized many of those it was intended to serve. I speak now of the American Indian Training Schools or Boarding Schools, set up by various churches and government entities in the United States during the 19th and first half of the 20th century. The goal was both assimilation and elimination. Teach the Native Americans housed in the school how to be good Christians and Americans, with useful skills and ability with English, but at the same time suppress their own languages, religion and culture, and get paid by the state to do it. Now don't get me wrong, there was some good that came out of this system. There were job opportunities that became available to graduates that they would never have to otherwise had. But the cost to benefit was ultimately not worth it. Many participants were victimized in every way that a child can be victimized. In my own ever be humble opinion, the best thing to come out of this program was the rejection of forced assimilation and the resurgence of interest in traditional languages, cultures, and religions. But like I said, this was before I was born. During my life, there was a weak continuation of the program in many areas of the country. Some churches continued to propagate a Christianizing of Native Americans by offering their children placements in good Christian homes during the school year, where they could get a white man's education. Yes, that's the term they used. It is offensive. And learn English as well as to be taught proper religion. This program has now been largely discontinued. Current efforts are to build up the educational opportunities available on the reservations to where a proper education is available to all. I've personally volunteered time and money to such enterprises and will continue to do so. Early years. In my early years growing up, my two older sisters often complained about seeing things in the house. They freaked them out that none of the rest of us saw. I personally thought it was all in their heads because whenever I would come into the room, they claimed it would stop. I never saw anything. I won't venture to describe much of what they did. That's their story to tell, if they ever care to. Let's just say there were frequent mentions of floating eyes and disembodied heads and faces. Again, I never saw any of this. But I did end up spending many nights vigil on the floor of one of their rooms as a preventative. I honestly suspected that it was related to a confirmed peeping Tom issue we had in the neighborhood that seemed aimed at the little girls in our streets. This detail frames our initial response to the event this post describes, as well as some of the aftermath. The setup. When my older sister Layla is 12 years old, she makes a friend at school. Layla is from the Nevada Nation Reservation in the Four Corners area where Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Arizona all touch. It is the only place in the United States where four states come together. And a bit of a tourist trap moneymaker for the Navajo Nation, who owns the piece of land where it happens. I visited it once. It's pretty cool to get your picture taken with each foot and hand in a different state. Worth the cost to visit at least once in your life. And believe me, the money goes to good ends. Lily is living with a good Christian family for the school year, and she and Layla really hit it off. My mother Canary was a Christian missionary to Japan, who ended up doing research and writing books in both English and Japanese that were not particularly Christian in nature. We were raised with Japanese actively spoken in our home and at gatherings and activities outside our home. Many of my parents' friends were Japanese, 
We were taught to respect the language, religion, and culture of others. Period. Didn't matter which ones. And so, as Lily learns better English, Layla learns some never how. As Lily and Layla share religious experience in a Christian context, Layla learns from Lily the ways of her religion. And it's a mutually enriching. But then the school year draws to an end, and Lily is to return home a few states away. Layla is distraught. Canary opens discussions with Lily's mother, and it's decided that Layla will go home with Lily, since there's room on the bus, taking many young Navajos back home. They'll return together in the fall when the new school year starts. And so begins a pattern that will continue for much of Layla's remaining years of grade school. Lily never lives with us. We're now, we're not considered a suitable host family for a number of reasons. But she always returns to the same family, so she remains in the same school. Layla spends her summers on the reservation, and boy, she comes back home tanned. But even with a natural darkening of the skin, her blonde hair made blonder by the same exposure to the sun, and blue eyes are impossible to hide. She is not from the Dine. The trigger. When Layla was 17, she's helping Lily's family at a roadside stand, where they sell much of their jewellery. Lily's family is famous for their silver and turquoise jewellery. What they don't sell to trading posts, they sell directly along the roadside. Something Lily made very clear from the beginning is that Layla would not be learning anything about making jewellery. Family secrets are family secrets. And even other Navajo families would like to learn her family's techniques. This is a multi-generational nope. But Layla can help the family sell their wares. On this day, things do not go well. They make some good sales, that's not the issue. They have a visit from a person to whom the family pays great deference. Layla has never seen them so respectful with anyone before. The visitor speaks no English, but is clearly very unhappy about the presence of my sister with the family. Her aspect is angry and indignant. While Leela barely understands what she says, the gist is understood. When the visitor has left, Lily's mother tells Layla, Tomorrow, you go home. I cannot protect you from this. And so Layla returns home a month early by a greyhound. She gives no explanation. It will be years until I get the full story that I'm sharing here. The consequence. About a week after Layla returns home, something starts to happen. To understand this part of the story, you need to understand a bit of the layout of our neighbourhood. Our house is on a three-quarter acre lot at the end of a circle, with a farm on one side and a small river running behind it. At this time, the other side of the river is mostly fields and horse pastures. There are animals we normally see here. We have about a hundred cats living in and around our property. We have dogs. We have frogs and muskrats and other creatures that need the river to live. We have snakes and any kind of insect that you can imagine. We're too far into the populated areas to ever see any large predators. No mountain lions, no coyotes, no wolves, no bears, no foxes, not even many raccoons. There are cows and horses in the neighbourhood, and a rooster crow will wake us most mornings. Tonight, I'm awakened from a deep sleep by Layla. We're all gathered into the highest room in the house. The room where Layla sleeps when she's home. There's a howling in the breeze, coming from somewhere beyond the river. I'm not clever enough to know the difference between wolf and coyote howls, but it's definitely along those lines. I've heard this song before when on a survival camp in the deserts. It came clear and crisp on the wind and woke me then. It was so cold at night in the desert. The fire was out, but the howls were far away, so no worries. Then a response came from the other side of us, and it was much too close for comfort. I did not sleep again that night. And now, something like that song is being sung here in town, where it has no business being. And it's getting closer. At my older sister's instruction, we all join in prayer together. After that, I don't recall much more that night. I wake up in the morning on the floor in my sister's room, 
When asking about last night, no one will talk about it. I have a million questions, but will get no answers. And then night comes again. This time we're all gathered in my sister's room and the sleeping bags are brought out. We pray together and I eventually drift off to the wonderful land of Nod, only to be awakened by howling again, only much closer. I drift in and out of sleep. In the morning, there are scratch marks on the back door, only they're too high for a normal canine to have made, and they're deep and powerful. The medicine woman. This day, Layla is able to get Lily on the phone. After they talk, my older sister drives Layla somewhere, but again, no one is telling me anything. I will later learn that Lily gave Layla the name of a medicine woman near us. Name and address, no phone number. Lily told her to tell the medicine woman what had happened on the reservation and that a dogman had been sent. In the evening, Canary brings a piece to breast the house and each of us. After we leave, my sisters bring in a short old Navajo woman with a deep smile and a great deal of silver and turquoise literally from head to foot. She wears a short round hat and has her hair in two long grey braids down both sides of her face. They go to at least her knees and have a lot of silver and turquoise woven in as well. She has three bundles of smudge. One is definitely white sage, but I have no idea what the other two are. She smudges the house in each of us. She uses each of the bundles for different things. She chants slash sings in Navajo the whole time. My sisters go into my sister's room with her and you can hear talking and more singing. I'm not allowed to see and it's never spoken of again. We again huddled in my sister's room that night. We pray together and sing church songs together. The old Navajo woman sits in a chair in the hall beside the back door and watches and listens and hums to herself. When the howling starts, she gets up and walks outside. Tonight, the howling stays distant. It never approaches. In the morning, the old woman smiles at me kindly. She says, three more. Layla explains that we need to do it all again for three more nights. And we do. Smudge and chant and songs and prayer. The howling seems further each night. Last night, it wasn't heard at all. Howling of this kind will never be heard again in my neighborhood. In the morning, Layla makes a gift to the old woman of some beautiful pieces of jewelry that Lily and her family had given her over the years. They were accepted graciously, looking at one that had particular emotional importance to my sister. She shakes her head and hands it back. No, she keeps the rest. She smiles deeply at me as she leaves. I'll never see her again, but I can never forget her deep, pure smile. She was a force for good in the world. Later. In later years, as I learn the rest of the story described above, I ask Layla to explain Dogman to me. She just smiles and says that talking about it will invite it, and that it's not an invitation she's making. She'll speak no further about it. Layla and Lily continue to be as close as any sisters. But Lily will never allow Layla to return to live with her on the reservation again. She says it's too dangerous. Lily does eventually live with us. She lives rent-free while going to college. For all intents and purposes, she is my sister. I asked her once about this event. She smiles and chides me with the one phrase that I hear most often from her. You talk too much. She then tells me that this is not for me and that this is all I will ever get from her on the matter. From what I've been able to gather from hearing my sister speak on the matter twice more over the years and just picking up things here or there, it seems that no matter where my sister went, this dogman would have found her and it would not have ended well. The medicine woman help us by misdirecting it and sending it on an impossible trail to follow and keep it busy until this assignment was replaced by a new one. I could be wrong about this, but that's what it sounded like to me. I have of course since heard of skinwalkers, 
and now realise this is the modern term for what Lily called a dogman back in the day. It was not a term any of us had heard when these events happened. I never saw it. I was never told much about it. I'm not a source of any useful information on the topic. I can only relate what happened one summer, many decades ago, when my sister returned home unexpectedly early from the reservation. The aftermath. In the years after this event, my older sisters would move out and on with their lives. During the winter following these events, I start to wake up in my room from time to time to find a floating face of a beautiful woman over me, as gorgeous as she is terrifying. And in a flash, it's gone. This only ever happened in the lower part of the house. In the highest part of the house next to my sister's room, where we gathered on those tense nights in August, there's a large family room. After these events, Every time I take a nap on the sofa in that room, the sleep is fitful and disturbed. I have no history of sleep paralysis at this time, but now experience something like it. I wake up unable to move or speak, fight myself upright, only to find I'm dreaming and now awake, unable to move or speak. And the cycle would continue. I sometimes fight up six layers of dreaming until I'm actually awake and perfectly able to move. More like a dream of sleep paralysis than the actual thing. As I'm drifting off to sleep on the sofa, I'll sometimes feel a weight on top of me. It often feels like it falls through me. I feel like I'm out of sync with my body and either floating over it or falling through it again and again and again. It's like a dream of falling and not falling at the same time. At the same time, on the edges of sleep, I hear a cacophony of voices chanting some indecipherable, something that sounds like a back mask clip of the Beatles. It is maybe 10 seconds long. Then it stops, and a few minutes later starts again. Sometimes in one ear. Sometimes the other. Sometimes both, but not in sync. This also happens a few times in the lower part of the house. I dread falling asleep on that sofa, and yet I seem to irresistibly drop off on it quite frequently. Nowhere else in the house do I experience this combination of odd dreams and sensations. I do not know if it all relates to the events of that summer. I only know that it never happened before. and never stopped happening after for as long as I lived in that house. Perhaps this event opened up a part of me that was previously oblivious and blind to such things. Perhaps that upstairs retained some of the protection the medicine woman had placed there. I'm not a clever man. I have no idea. I can only relate what I experienced. This happened when I was younger, around eight or nine. I grew up on a reservation in eastern Maine. I lived with my mother and brother who were younger. We lived in a two-story multi-dwelling unit or public housing. Vast wooded area was in my backyard, surrounded by deep woods and wouldn't take much to get lost. But I always enjoyed adventuring and was very familiar with the territory. It was late winter with about four to five inches of snow on the ground. I heard knocking on the front and back door at the same time, around one in the morning. I noticed it first and then my mother got up and told my brother and I to stay in the room. She called the police and went downstairs to see if someone was at the door. We kept hearing the knocking, but as my mother got closer to the door, it suddenly stopped. No one she could see outside the door and police finally showed up. Lights lit up the front door of our place. Neighbours came out to see what was going on as we had five neighbours in our MDU. All of them said they didn't hear or see anyone. Police searched around the property to see if anyone was hiding or ran off, but they didn't find anything. A cruiser stayed in our parking lot for the majority of the night, in case anyone came again. Sunrise came and the officer had left early in the morning. My mother and next door neighbour went outside. I assumed to talk about what happened. Then she noticed footprints in the snow that went along the building leading to our front door and back all the way into the forest. But these footprints were strange. It's as if someone was wearing pointed boots men's size between 10 to 12. 
The prints were inverted, as if the toes were facing each other. Not at an angle, either. Directly facing each other in a straight line. The creepiest part about them was that the steps of the footprints moved side to side. Toes were inverted and looked as if they jumped like that side to side in a perfect straight line, leading into the woods. My mother didn't say anything about them till later on in life when I was older. But I knew what they were. It was obvious. I know what you're thinking. Maybe someone was playing a prank or faked it. There were other footprints in the snow around the strange ones, but only around the building. I assume the other footprints were made by the officers, due to the fact that they looked normal. But there were no other prints in the snow, leading up to the tree line. I followed the prints into the woods. No other markings around them perfectly inverted side to side, hops or steps in the snow, leading deeper and deeper into the forest. I got to the point where an uneasy feeling crept over me, like something was telling me to go back. But I knew where the prints were leading. As I said, I was very familiar with the area. It eventually would have led into a marsh or bog area. I got chilled by that thought for some reason and turned back. I never said anything to my mother about it till later on. I never heard or encountered anything like it ever since. Back around 2013, my family and I took a trip to Italy for my aunt's wedding. They had rented this huge, gorgeous Italian villa in Toscana. Villa de Uliginano, to be exact. If anyone would like to find pictures of the location to get a better idea. The room I was staying in was Napoleon Gala. That's property owner told me Napoleon had stayed there in the 17th century. But I'm not sure that's bullshit. And I'm not saying in any way, I think that was his point. The room was on the second floor. There were two floors below us with the large dining room taking up the first and second floor, above the ground floor. Hopefully that provides some idea of the floor plan of the story. Anyways, one of the nights I went to bed was pretty normal. Of course, we weren't going to sleep until around 12 to 1 a.m. due to the time zone change coming from the US. But other than that, I never had an issue sleeping. I can't remember what night exactly this was, but it was around halfway through the week-long stay. I had fallen asleep around the previous stated time, and almost as quickly as I fell asleep, I woke up downstairs on one of the small couch-like seat things in the bottom floor of the dining room. My body was overcome with chills. I had this feeling of being watched the entire time. And I was just feeling super disoriented. Mainly confused as how I got there, as I've never been a sleepwalker or anything. The strangest thing to me, however, was my trip back to the room. I had this constant feeling of eyes on me, and a sense of being followed, but wasn't even the strangest to me. As I said before, the dining room took up the first floor and second floor, the one I was staying on. The second floor of the dining room being a balcony type thing, running around the wall. But I wandered the single staircase for what seemed like minutes. I swear, I walked up the stairs to the second floor and would just be on a completely different floor. I began to panic a bit, but eventually went up the stairs into my floor and booked it into my room. My phone said it was 4 a.m. I told a few family members the next day, but was just disregarded. My family telling me that I was probably just tired and sleepwalking and all that, but I'm absolutely th certain what I thought happened truly did. The whole villa was a strange place. One of the side rooms on the ground floor housed a small chapel-like room with a bunch of three slash four foot tall religious figures and an adjoining room with just a stone table in it. The trip just felt weird after that. I couldn't have been happier to leave. So my house is pretty old, built in 1920, and I've had some weird experiences here, but nothing as interesting as this. Between the ages of six to eight, I had at least 20 different experiences, where I would be in my basement bathroom, either getting ready for school or, you know, 
using the bathroom, when I would suddenly see a figure out of the corner of my eye in the mirror. It was a roughly 25-year-old man in a blue navy sailor outfit, and he would always just stare back at me with a pale, blank expression, before disappearing after a second or two. For some reason, this didn't scare me whatsoever as a kid, and I never felt like it was evil or malicious being. I didn't even tell my parents about it, and I just kind of accepted it every time I saw him. So as I get older, this phenomenon stops happening to me, and I just kind of store it away in the back of my memory until one very interesting Saturday morning in 2018. I'm 22 years old at this time, and I was in that same basement bathroom getting ready for the day when my mom called me upstairs. I go up to talk to her, and she tells me that earlier in the day, she was enjoying her morning tea on the front porch when an older man approached our house. He described himself as a sort of local historian who was researching veterans of World War II in my town. He went on to tell my mom that through his research, he discovered that one of the first US deaths in the war was a Navy sailor who originally lived in my house before going off to war. Apparently, he was one of the first to die during the attack on Pearl Harbor. He told my mom that he would come back with more research on this guy, but has since never returned. My mom knows I'm kind of a history geek and thought I would love hearing about a little bit of World War II history with our home. As she tells me about this, a flood of memories come to mind of me being a child and seeing that pale man in the mirror stare at me. Since then, I've told my parents all about those childhood experiences but nothing else weird happened and the local historian has never returned. I've always heard that children are more susceptible to come into, into contact with the supernatural, and that would explain why that only happened to me as a kid. Was it an evil being? Was it the spirit of that sailor just checking in on his old home? I'm not sure, but I still always get a little freaked out when I talk into that room and look in the mirror. So this happened around five years ago, and it hasn't left my mind since. It never occurred to me to post anything about it, because I thought people would think I'm insane, but here we go. So me and my girlfriend at the time were having a bit of a stale point in our relationship. Thought we would do something to spice it up, so we decided to go to a large stately home, turned museum, near to where I lived. Just to give you an idea of what the areas looked like before I go further, it was a huge three-story house that a duke or a lord would live in, and opposite it, there was a large path with trees along the side of the path. A field on the other side of these trees, and a forest at the end of the path. So me and my girlfriend, who I'll be referring to as C for the rest of this, walk down the path to find a nice, quiet spot. Now, take into account this is at around 11 or 12 p.m., so it's pitch black other than the reddish moon in the sky. So we put down a blanket and started to talk. As soon as things start getting a little frisky, I hear something coming from the end of the path that sounds like a town crier's bell. I sit up, confused, as it seems to be coming towards us with nothing there. There was a bush next to me and as soon as I set up, it was like something big moved in it. So I jumped up and went into fight mode, hearing what sounds like multiple voices in the bush. The bell is still going off. When I jumped up, I looked around to see if I could see anything, and this was where things got really weird. Being able to see the field in between the trees, there were figures standing in the field. Spaced out, but they were wearing what looked like black KKK uniforms, and they didn't look real. In the way that they didn't look solid, looking at them was like looking at liquid. They seemed to phase in and out. It's very difficult to describe it. At this point, I grab C up from the floor and I say, we need to go, now. And we start to make our way out of the field. While we're walking, I look to my right and see a circle of those people, just staring in our direction and start to hear real heavy footsteps behind us. We start to run and it's like something grabbed C's bag. There's no bushes or trees for at least 30 feet, so it wasn't that. But we get out and we look at her back and it's like it was slashed with a knife right through the strap. It wasn't like the clip had broken, it was straight through. I 
I would like to preface this with confirmation that I was not and never have been on drugs. I don't suffer any mental conditions and I'm otherwise in tip-top shape, apart from some Christmas weight that's been around for about four years. So me and C, my girlfriend at the time, spoke about what happened after around a week of us just skirting around it, both not wanting to talk about any of it. As we spoke, I realised that we had both seen almost exactly the same things. She also saw the figures in the field, and when I went back there the following morning, there was nothing that could have been mistaken for them in the dark. No hedges, no bushes, nothing. I also spoke to one of my friends about it, and he didn't believe a word of it, so we decided to go back with torches and see what we can find. His name will be B. My other friend who joined us will be referred to as J, and C brought her best friend L. I went and picked up B and J and planned to meet them at the entrance to the grounds. We were laughing and joking about what we were going to find, as I was wondering if what I saw was even real, but I was feeling a hell of a lot more confident with my two buddies by my side. As we approached the entrance, we saw C and L sprint out towards us. Both of their faces show that they're really scared of something. After about five minutes of calming them down, they told us that they were planning on hiding down one of the side paths and jumping out to scare us, but Elle felt something touch her hair. She assumed it was a tree branch or something until something grabbed her hair as if it was trying to pull her back. She managed to get out and as they ran, something threw three sticks after them. I had a look down this side path but didn't find anything. I can't verify any of that as I wasn't there, but moving forward, it will all be from my own perspective and what I saw, and what I heard. We started to make our way back into the ground, and began walking towards the spot we were in the last time, and nothing happened. No figures standing in the field, no noises, nothing. I remember it being deathly quiet, almost too quiet. It was so unnerving. This is when I shine my torch across the tree line of the forest, and I can see a figure of a really tall man. The best way I can describe it is Slenderman with a human face, and he sunk onto the floor as if his legs were sliced off at the knees. It was fucking strange, and I'm getting goosebumps talking about it again. I turned my torch off, and I was able to see him so much clearer, and he slowly turned around and walked into the forest, almost trying to lure me in. I looked at my friends, and no one had seen anything else. We started moving as a group down towards a small stream that's near where the forest meets the path, and I realise C is missing. I start freaking out, and she comes sprinting out of the forest, white as fuck, and tells me that she saw a man that beckoned her to come into the forest, and it was like she didn't have control of herself. She went into the forest and snapped out of it when something grabbed her shoulder, making her realise how far into the forest she went, and she sprinted out. At this point, I tell everyone else to wait near the stream, and I start walking further in with B, and I hear something that still rattles through my head from time to time. It was a growl. Borderline roar, but it was nothing like any of the wildlife we have. It sounded angry, and the worst part, it came from the sky. I could tell it wasn't echoing off of anything, and it was just coming from the sky. That was more than enough for me, and all of us to get the fuck out of there. Never speak a word of it again, and never go back. This event occurred back in 2001, I want to say, as I was still in college at NMSU at the time. It was fall, and me and three other friends decided to take part in a camping trip up to the Gaila National Forest. There was snow on the ground at our campsite, so it must have been mid to late fall. Anyway, we decided to take a day trip to go up to a remote lake that I know of that was a very picturesque and serene. It took a while to get up there, but once we were there, it was great. Until the storm came. It seemed to come out of nowhere, and it was like it was on top of us at a ridiculous time. We didn't even make it back to my jeep before sleet was pelting us. Once we were in the jeep, we figured we'd better get back to the campsite. So we headed back down the winding trail 
in full low, mind you, because you know the ground was beginning to freeze over. While we were driving through the forest trail on an iced road, tons of animals started running out across the path from left to right, and in that direction only. There were deer, elk, raccoons, rabbits, skunks, etc. That was weird in itself. But when we got to the small one-road town between the mountain and our campsite, we saw something weirder. Six black military-style vehicles with tarp-like coverings on the cargo areas were all driving in a convoy back up towards where we just came from. No idea what they were doing going back up to that remote stormy location. We finally arrived at our campsite and we immediately noticed a huge orange glow on the horizon, just over the area of the lake we were at. It looked like a forest fire, except it didn't taper off at the ends like a fire would, and it vanished after about two hours. Forest fires don't do that, so what the heck? After the weird fire looking light disappeared, we started seeing long white streaks in the sky above us that would disappear and reappear in counts of three, four, two, five, and alternates. This freaked out two of the guys to the point that they retired to the tent. But me and the other dude stayed up staring at these white light streaks for some time before they vanished for the night. Needless to say, we were more than eager to pack up and head back home in the morning. One last curious thing is that we stopped at a cafe on the way back to civilization to gas up and use the restroom. Outside the cafe, there were copies of the daily newspaper that read, Solar Flare, Seen in the Sky. Really? I'm no expert, but I don't think our encounter that night is very indicative of solar flares. I grew up in a small town in Oklahoma. Our town was actually founded in the late 19th century. In fact, the cemetery where we would play Ouija and gravestones that had birth dates starting in the 1800s. When I was about 14, I got into the idea of Ouija and the spiritual world, just reading about it all the time. I'm not a very religious person, but the opportunity to speak with beings who have passed over will never not fascinate me. So it was around then that I and a couple of my friends made our own board, out of the box that my Guitar Hero guitar came in. I drew the letters and words on it with a sharpie, and we used the shot glass as the glass piece. I still have it in my parents' garage to this day. There were many, many times we had our older siblings drive us to the graveyard at night so we could play. I want to share the name of it so you guys can look it up for yourselves. There's fucking videos on YouTube of the cemetery that I played Ouija in as a teenager, so just let me know if you do, and I can send it to you for privacy reasons. It's pretty weird to see the name of your hometown in the titles of scary YouTube videos. But anyways, I just want to tell you guys the reason why I began taking it so seriously, and then the story that made me stop playing Ouija for years. There were five of us, and I was always the one asking questions. We would bring a big quilt for us to sit on, white candles and a lighter, our board and peace. We'd hold hands and ask if anyone wanted to talk with us, sharing what we'd love to talk with them, and then begin. Two of my friends who were too scared to play would just watch, and the rest of us had fingers on the piece. The second time we ever played, I asked the person we were speaking to if they were buried there in the graveyard, and they said yes. I asked them their name, and they gave us their initials, EKW. We asked them politely what that we wanted to stop talking, so we could go find her gravestone. We moved it to goodbye, and then we stood up, all pulled out our phones to use as flashlights, and started walking around the cemetery looking for EKW. After several minutes, one of my friends yelled, Guys? The rest of us ran over to my friend who was standing there, frozen, there it was, EKW. She had died sometime in the 1920s. All five of us started freaking out, yelling, Hi EKW, thanks for talking with us. We decided that was enough Ouija for the night. Let's end it on a positive note. Fast forward to a couple years later, when I could drive. I had a tiny ass manual Mitsubishi Eclipse, but it was the best first car ever. 
I'm still playing Ouija, mostly in the summers. I had the same few friend groups, though most from high school. But these girls were the most fun. Nobody else would follow me to a graveyard to talk to dead people as the sun goes down. One night, we had our usual setup and had already had a conversation or two with some peeps. Then we said aloud that we wanted to speak with someone new. Anyone. We wanted to make a new friend like EKW. Someone said hello. We said hi back. I asked this thing its name. It said Oz. I thought, Oz? That's a weird one. But we kept dicking around with him. Then I asked him if we should be afraid of him. He said yes. I told him we were going to leave. He said no. Then the piece started moving back and forth between O and Z. I said, dude, I know your name is Oz. We get it. Then this fucker started moving down the alphabet, getting faster and faster. I remembered that I had read that when the piece is moving down the alphabet, it's a bad sign. It can mean the spirit you're speaking with is pissed off and or trying to come out of the board, whatever that means. I told my friends we have to physically move it to goodbye, not to let it keep sliding across the board, so we did. I picked up the piece and slammed it down on top of goodbye as well. We all looked at each other. One of us said, yeah, let's leave. So we did. I grabbed the board and piece. My friends started grabbing the candles and folding the quilts and we began walking back to my car. You know that feeling you get where something could be following you, but as long as you walk and don't run, you don't feel freaked out? I'm laughing while typing this, just thinking about it. Two of them were already in my car, pulling the front seats forward and climbing in the back of my little two-door shit queen. I was almost out of the cemetery, about to walk through the gates, when I heard running footsteps behind me. I did not even think about looking back. I let out a screech and started sprinting. I was about 10 feet away from my car and I probably reached that hoe in like four strides. I was booking it so hard. I ain't fast either. My manual that wished she were an automatic wouldn't start. I kept stomping on the clutch and brake and finally my key turned. All while my friends were screaming at me, go bit go. It's a gravel pathway, only big enough for one car at a time that we have to drive up and down to get in and out of the graveyard. My poor baby was fishtailing. I was moving so fast. It's so dark too. There's only one street light near the graveyard and it's right at the entrance at the turn off from the main road. We were surrounded by nothing but trees in the dim moonlight. We got back to our friend's mom's house and we're all practically yelling at her in the kitchen about what just happened. She called us idiots and she said she didn't want that shit in her house. So I took it back outside and put it in the trunk of my car. I didn't have the feeling that I was being watched anymore, but I just felt different. I don't know how to explain it. I went back inside and they were already looking up the name Oz in Ouija. I rent a house. So far, I've never had any bad vibes. It feels great, to be honest, and I love it here. I've previously lived in a potentially haunted house and had weird vibes in places, so I certainly know the difference between a welcome home and an uncomfortable one. However, on occasion, twice now, I've had mysterious noises. This afternoon, I was in the kitchen preparing food for myself. I was home alone when I heard a loud clatter from somewhere in the house. But I couldn't pinpoint it to any one room. It was loud enough to think something moderately heavy had fallen and perhaps clattered against something. Like multiple items clattering together if that makes sense. Perhaps books or CDs falling off of a shelf or maybe my son's toys. My first thought was maybe my child had stacked something awkwardly on his desk and something had knocked them off. But I checked and all his toys were fine nothing had fallen. I also perhaps thought maybe some clothes had fallen off the coat hangers and perhaps landed on something. I checked the bedrooms, the living room, etc. Absolutely nothing had fallen or been disturbed. But this isn't the first time. 
The very same thing happened about three to four weeks ago. I was having a smoke at the back door of the house and heard a load of tumbling and crashing sounds, but couldn't locate the source. I know it's not an intruder. The house is tiny and I've checked everywhere. No cellar, sealed off attic, etc. I have no pets. My son wasn't home. It genuinely sounded like a phantom noise, loud enough to make me jump. So that rules out any sounds coming from the neighbours. I never hear either neighbour. The walls are quite thick. There's nothing in the back garden that could have made the noise either, nor from the front street, which is generally quiet. Utterly baffled. What makes it weirder is that I couldn't tell if the sound came from upstairs or downstairs, just somewhere very close, i.e. a room or two away. That said, even after that, I still feel safe here, so I don't think it's anything malignant. I should also add, I was sober both times it happened. I'm 18, turning 19 on April 14th, and I work in dining at a large retirement home. I would say there are anywhere from 1,500 to 2,000 people. I've worked there since July of 2020. In the beginning of this March, myself and my co-worker were assigned to set up a meeting room with coffee and scones and clean it when it was finished. About two years after I set up the meeting, my manager told me to go check to make sure they still had enough coffee and whatnot. I was reluctant to walk in, as I just had a general sense that I shouldn't. And I could hear people crying inside the room. When I walked in, it looked like an AA meeting but with seniors, and the two hosts were the heads of the CC, Continued Care Programme. Basically, if you already have a disease like Alzheimer's, dementia, Parkinson's, etc., before you move in, they won't allow you to. However, if you develop one while you're a resident, you get sent to the CC wing once it's needed. The lady who was talking had half of her face looking like it was melting, and she was also drooling as she talked. She said she was being sent to CC, and that she wanted to be killed or die. The atmosphere in the room was palpable. Then, like the idiot of I am, I asked the hosts if they had enough coffee and scones. She took me outside and yelled at me for being rude but I told her my manager made me check. The host said it was fine then, but to please not come back until the meetings were over. When it was, my co-worker and I were sent to clean the room up. We were both facing the left wall closest to the door, stacking plastic cups, when a very intense wave of nausea came over me for about five to 10 seconds, almost making me vomit. Along with that was a feeling of dread, almost like I wanted to die or that I was convinced I was going to. After my nausea faded away, my co-worker told me that she suddenly felt very nauseous. That really creeped me the fuck out because I never even told her that I felt nauseous. I never told her because I didn't want to freak her out. Until I left the room, there was a very uneasy feeling. The feeling you get when you're in a place you're not supposed to be in, or lost in a building. I never saw anything or remember a temperature change of any kind. I've been back into that room and nothing has happened. Maybe it was just a really strange coincidence. I don't really know. I just thought I would share it here and see what people think. My dad was the ultimate skeptic and raised me to think the same. However, there have been a lot of weird happenings in my life. Some I put down to being observant of smaller signs. Like the time I was having dreams the company I was working for suddenly collapsed, leaving us all out of work. I was laughing about it with one of my colleagues about the constant dreams. Three weeks later, the company suddenly collapsed. My co-worker asked me if I had any other feelings, so I told her she was pregnant and my boss would be a father within a year. She denied it at the time, but came back six weeks later to tell me she was seven weeks pregnant at the time she asked me, but didn't want to say anything until she reached the 12-week mark. However, with her, I'd noticed her not drinking alcohol at her work function the week before. Maybe I'd picked up other subtle signs about her and signs about my boss. My boss and his wife had their first child about eight to nine months after the collapse. With the company collapse looking back, 
I remember staff expenses not being paid. Payroll inexplicably not going through on time due to banking errors and other signs. Others are a bit more unexplainable, but were verified by people who remembered what I had said. A few examples were as follows. The night I had a vivid dream about being out in a boat with a friend with diving gear. I hate boats, can't swim very well and have never used diving gear. But I could smell the sea, feel the weight of the diving gear and feel the boat rocking. A small plane flew overhead, crashed into the sea and the plane sank with the pilot and passengers inside. My friend and I put back on our breathing gear, grabbed the extra tanks we had with us and went down. Got the pilot and passengers out and brought them back up. I remember looking at a depth gorge on my wrist and we were almost to the plane and saw how the wreckage landed on the bottom. I told my friend that I shared an apartment about it the next morning. She knew that I didn't like boats and I knew she would find it hilarious, which she did until news broke of a missing plane. She thought I couldn't have picked it, so she wrote down my description of the plane that had come overhead, the distance I remembered being from shore and the depth I remember diving down to. I had the distance from shore, the depth of water the plane was found in, the number of people in the plane, and pretty much the description of the plane. This was about a week or so later, the information was released. After a few years later, a little girl in my country was reported missing by her mother and her mother's boyfriend. She was about the same age as my child. I was heading to work one morning and thinking of her, wishing she could just be found safe from harm. I was taking a shortcut through a walking path, going past trees, and I looked to the side and I swore I saw her, standing next to an old half-open suitcase near the trees, just looking sadly at me. I just looked at her and thought, where are you? She just looked down at the suitcase and back at me when she was gone. We were talking at work about the disappearance. Everyone was worried and hoped she would be found soon and safe. I mentioned I must be too wrapped up in the case due to having a child the same age, but how I could have sworn I saw her on my way to work, standing in the trees next to a suitcase. Yeah, funny how your mind plays tricks on you when you really want to find someone safe and okay. Eight months later, her mother was arrested. It came out she had been killed by her mother and put in a suitcase for days. She then had been buried in Bushland. R.I.P. little one. I was going to a dressy dinner function with my husband. The only dress I could find that I liked was a dark navy blue. I remember looking in the mirror and thinking, well, at least if I can't wear it for dinner, I can wear it for the funeral. And then thinking that was odd. No one I knew was ill and I was definitely going to a function the next night. That night, I got a call letting me know a family member was seriously ill and had been admitted to hospital. I didn't go to the function, but went down to sit by their bedside. I was really worried, but after a week, they came through it, were released from hospital, and all was supposedly fine. I was speaking to a family friend after they came home and saying how worried I had been when I heard they were ill, and the story of the dress purchase and how glad I was I was wrong. A week later, my family member was suddenly readmitted to hospital and died the next morning. At the funeral, the family friend came up to me, looked me up and down and said, so that is the dress. And I said yes. 